You good to go? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So, good evening, all of you. As we are here for the internal audit symposium arranged by WIRC, and we have with us, uh, I recognize the presence of CA Gautam Lad, Secretary WIRC, then CA Ruta Chitay, Madam, Regional Council Member, and both the faculties for the day, CA Sachin Malu and CA Chetanji Thakkar. So, and we also have CA Neera Sayya, coordinator for the event today. So, with this, actually, uh, we always in WRC are striving to uh, have good seminars and seminars with the new, where, wherein we can uh, provide the members with the knowledge about the new areas of practice, something new coming up, something wherein we should go for other than traditional practices. And for this, this virtual seminar, because it should reach to all. And for that, to have, with this background, we have an office bearer, CA Gautam Lad, secretary with us. I'll request uh, for him his opening, opening remarks. Thank you, Piyush. Um, so as we all know, Piyush Bhai is chairperson of Vikasa and Vikasa is doing wonderful activities. Let me first start by, uh, you know, congratulating the entire team, Murtaja Bhai and our chairman, uh, C. Ankit Rati for this wonderful structure. And today, you know, we have two very important process. Procure to pay as, you know, we all do in days, our day-to-day -day life and it's one of the crucial process of internal audit. And the second one is hire to retire. So I'm sure both the faculties, the immense experience which Chetan Bhai and Sachin Bhai has, I'm sure we all will be greatly benefited. <clears throat> uh, friends, about WIRC, there are uh, one or two couple of initiatives which I would like to talk about. Uh, the first one is that, uh, you know, one request I would like to make is about that, you know, whatever today we are, it is because of these two letters CA. So whatever, you know, all of us are earning today, whatever respect we are getting in the fraternity, it is because of our two-letter CA. Uh, friends, sometimes we see, you know, there are certain negative news about a particular chartered accountant and intentionally or unintentionally, we tend to forward it and we tend to circulate it among social media. So my only request is that, uh, you know, let us protect this brand. Let us, uh, you know, take this uh, brand to the greater height height what you know our forefathers have created and let us refrain ourselves from forwarding negative news instead of that if we can you know start forwarding positive news about ca fraternity that would be really helpful it will create a perception in gen uh, perception in general people in our clients in uh, bureaucrats or in regular in the mind of regulator that will immensely help you know ultimately all of us as a ca together so that's one request i thought uh, i'll make it to you uh, see, we have started many initiatives to have, you know, this, uh, uh, to have this wonderful perception in the mind of regulator. We decided when 24th of Feb, we took charge. Uh, so me and chairman, we were sitting together. We thought that, you know, how to create a good perspective of chartered accountants among the regulator. So that's when we have decided that, uh, you know, we'll establish WIRC ICI as a knowledge partner. And I'm very proud today to share with you that, uh, we have trained uh, SEBI officers, we have trained uh, uh, RBI officers, we have trained GST officers, we have trained Maharashtra State Electricity Board, we have trained EOW, we have trained EATS, we have trained SFIO. So there is hardly any name, either we are training them or we are in discussion. So that's how we are creating an image of Chartered Accountant as a knowledge partner amongst various stakeholders and various regulators. The same request I would like to make with you today that, you know, let us protect this brand with uh, whatever, you know, however we can do. So let us create a positive atmosphere about chartered accountancy in social media. And we are also coming up with our large mega event of uh, regional conference, which is on 23rd and 24th August at Geo Convention Center. Most of the big faculties of the country is coming there and it will be a great networking chance uh, the event will be attended by 5,000 chartered accountants. We are hopeful for that. Uh, hundreds of stalls, display of various audit tech, uh, text tech tools. So I request everyone to kindly enroll for that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Piyush Bhai. Over to you. Thank you very much, Gautam Bhai, for your opening remarks. Taking the cue from Gautam Bhai's talk, actually, I would like to further request members, as he rightly said, that we are the only culprits. We forward the negative news to amongst our uh, colleagues and everything. Instead of that, what we do in our family, what we'll do in case of any grievance, we'll go to the head of our family, right? 
So likewise, in WIRC also being the extended arm of ICAI, we are creating some links and grievance for the grievances of members. And surely in, uh, in the short span of time under the guidance of our chairman and the office bearers, we are going to float the links to members wherein you will be allowed to face, to, uh, uh, to submit all your grievances about anything in ICI and directly we will be forwarding those uh, grievances to the concerned authorities and also, as, also to Delhi and we will be taking follow-up also of that. So with this, I will request Ruta Madam to uh, take the charge and introduce the faculty for the first session. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Piyush Bhai. Let me take this opportunity to say that Gautam Lajji, Secretary and Ankit Rathi Chairman, sir, have given us all the RCMs a total free hand to conduct whatever programs uh, that we wish. And I really thank uh, all of them because this creates the entire WRC forward. Having said so, let me digress a small bit even more and say that on 11th of May, we are conducting a conclave on charitable trust and NPOs. So uh, whoever your friends are, if you are also interested in attending the conclave, it will be a good event to get update, updated on whatever uh, and latest amendments are on trust. We also will get to interact with the charity commissioner as well as uh, the CIT of exemptions. So do welcome uh, for all of you to this event. Having said so, today we have Sachin Maluji, who will be talking about a very important topic, one of the basic topics of internal audit, which is procure to pay. Payment, as you know, is such a sensitive issue and we need to keep a control B as well as the clients also need to keep a total control on this particular factor. So <clears throat> Sachin Maluji will definitely take us through how and what are the problems with procurement as well as what will be the issues and what will be the possible solutions also how we can help our clients not only our internal audit clients but also our other clients by having uh, went all the way through along with him through this important topic procure to pay introducing mr sachin malu sachin ji is a managing director with productivity india he has over 18 years of advisory experience he has advised several large Indian organizations and multinational corporations operating in oil and gas, pharmaceutical, logistics, FMCG, and manufacturing sector. His competencies are internal audit, enterprise risk management, controls transformation, designing of SOPs and processes re and process re-engineering. After spending 15 years across big force, he is now leading key sectors for West Region for productivity. I think we have an excellent faculty with us here, especially when he is designing SOPs. I hope that the audience will uh, definitely take advantage of this his experience and will question him also about how and what are the problems in uh, designing SOPs because that is the key to the entire internal audit process. That is where the internal audit process starts, in my opinion. So, having said so, Sachin Ji, such thank you so much for agreeing to be with us here. And over to you. Thank you, Ruta, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Gautam ji, Piyush ji, Neera. And uh, welcome everyone to this important session of procure to pay uh, I'll just display a presentation which we have made uh, for this particular... Uh, is it visible? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, you will want to add something? I just have to add something because there is one query regarding the WIFC. And uh, I would like to just answer that before you uh, start. Sure. The query says that uh, they are, uh, the one of the participants is trying to download the or view the videos and the YouTube link says is it is work in progress. So actually, I just had inquired with the staff. They have said that whenever the symposium completed, that means all the seminars of the symposium will be completed, the YouTube link will be active and you can definitely view all the seminars over there. So uh, I think this uh, answer is given for the query. And sir, over to you. And thank you for the uh, thank you for allowing me to answer it. Thank you. No problem, sir. So uh, friends, today uh, the intention is to cover the procure to pay process in detail. And my objective will be to take you through the entire process first at a broad level, then take you through the process. You know, assessment. How does someone try to create an understanding of the process, and post that identify which are the you know key risk and controls in the process and what are the typical observations that will come when we are doing an understanding or an audit of procure to pay uh, procure to pay uh, just as a summary i think it's it's very simple process the process focuses on identifying what we need to buy ensuring that you know uh, we find the right place to buy something 
and receiving you know uh, right place to buy something at the right price and at the right time receiving what we have ordered and making payment uh, you know as per the material that we have received in terms of uh, process overview and uh, this process ideally you know will change uh, depending on the sector in which we are operate uh, the sector the entire process focuses across procurement planning which ideally will mean understanding or planning you know what we need to procure creating a purchase requisition which will mean that identifying or requesting you know to the appropriate buyer to go ahead and procure a good the requisition ideally will cover the items the description of items the quantity the timeline by which we need it and an approval from the user team the buyer team in turn will you know identify the right vendor this may be an existing vendor or a new vendor so the sourcing of vendor obtaining quotations identifying vendors which are compatible you know to the company size which are agreeable to the company's terms and conditions uh, so obtaining quotations which will have pricing availability timeline by which you know the material will be received uh, the quality of work post that the stage comes where we enter into the contract with the selected vendor where there is a legally binding contract or a purchase order between the supplier and the buyer which will speak about the quantity the price the delivery the gst details the place of delivery and many more important things once this entire decision making is done i think the focus largely comes on ensuring that we receive what we order if we have ordered a particular quantity of a particular material with a defined quality it is important that you know the receipt at the receipt stage we are able to assess that we have received what we had ordered for so there is a quality check also there and post that making the payment as per the credit terms to the seller uh, in the right bank account that is something which you know which which encompasses in this entire process uh, just a detailing of uh, this you know uh, the the process that i have explained so an approved requisition where a purchase order is made and there are multiple sets of approval post which there is a process where a, you know this purchase order is given to the vendor it is going given to the user department and basis this purchase order the goods are received from the vendor and matched to pu uh, for a uh, validation that we have received what we have ordered as a part of accounts payable process ensuring that you know uh, the approved requisition which is the purchase order the receiving report and the invoice there is a two way match or a three way match which is done post which the payment voucher is approved basis which the payment is made to the vendor in the uh, correct bank account as when we need to understand the process right our first objective will be to go to the company or you know to the user function and try to understand how do they actually carry out the procurement as on date this user department the typical questions at the governance level will be to understand whether they have a procurement policy in place whether they have a standard operating procedure in place and an authorization matrix in place this three documents primarily will define how the management wants the procurement process to work in a authorized manner the second step will be to ask questions on how the procurement responsibility is divided within the procurement department so what is the organization structure of the procurement who reports into whom how much the procurement is centralized how much the procurement is decentralized which means how much procurement is carried out at the regional level or at the plant level and how much procurement is carried out by both the corporate and the regional offices in terms of roles and responsibilities a lot of places we have seen that 
the responsibility of the procurement is segregated based on the nature of items. So you will find people who specialize in procurement of steel, in procurement of bulk material, in procurement of uh, cement, in procurement of uh, IT material, right? So generally in a procurement department, the general tendency is that they will want their team member to specialize and hence it is important to know how the procurement organization is structured and what are the roles, responsibilities and the gamut of activities which each of the person in the procurement department is carrying on. It is also important to know what is the total number of vendors in the vendor master, how many vendors have been added in the audit period, uh, how many vendors have been blacklisted or suspended in the audit period and what are the different categories of vendor, which all vendors are for capex or for opex or uh, you know which all vendor are for IT procurement those segregation is also important to know. Again, on the item master, important to know which are the new items which are created. What are the controls within the system to ensure that there is no duplication of vendors, there is no duplication of item master, unless it is needed for a specific purpose. For example, duplicate vendors may exist. However, their location-wise, you know, the address may differ. And hence, in certain instances, we have seen that you, there are duplicate vendors at uh, you know in the, in the ERP system. It is also important to understand what is the total procurement value. Out of this procurement value, how much is purchase order based procurement and how much is the non PO based procurement, as well as if any of the procurement is carried out to the emergency procurement method, which will result in bypassing the overall controls. Uh, in the procurement cycle. When it comes to the purchase order process, it is important to know uh, whether there is a delegation of authority which will list down the people who have the authority to approve the purchase order. Has the purchase order process been defined and documented? How are the items ordered and approved? Uh, who are the creator of purchase orders? Who are the people you know who approve the purchase order? How are the purchase order post approval submitted or pre approval submitted to the approvers? And post approval, it goes to all the relevant stakeholders. Uh, who are the people who are authorized to order certain type of material? For example, in a manufacturing entity, there are certain materials which can be ordered by stores and certain materials which can be ordered by the user department only. Right. Uh, coming to vendor management, this is one of the most important segment uh, of the procure to pay process. Vendor management ideally will mean uh, developing a good vendor database to meet the company's requirement and over a period of time, ensuring that we keep on adding relevant and good vendors so that as a company, we have a choice of reaching out to multiple vendors and thereby strengthening our process of price discovery and also ensuring that we are working with the best of the vendors available for us. So the discussion point to understand the process of vendor management is largely to understand who has access to create the vendors, who chooses and approves new vendor. Is there a vendor development process? If there is a vendor development process, what is the overall KPIs? What are the you know, objective, what are the targets given to these uh, department who is looking after vendor development? Is there an approved vendor list? Which means out of the vendors, do we know who are the vendors who are approved? And the remaining vendors either may be not approved as on date because we may not have purchased anything from them. Also, there may be vendors who are suspended because of some process related or performance related issues in the past and they may be blacklisted as well. What uh, type of vendors are required to be under contract? So most of the vendors, the company will either deal through a contract method or through a purchase order method. So segregating for a particular nature of item, which of the items needs to be procured under an agreement and which are the nature of items which can be procured under a purchase order. 
uh, how the contracts are negotiated with large vendors so that we can upfront commit a annual procurement value to them to ensure that we get the best of the price and overall a vendor performance management process will depending on the category of vendor it may include the price which is being given to us the timeliness of delivery the quality of material which is given to us and many such parameters depending on the sector in which we are operating and uh, the nature, the category of vendor uh, who are being evaluated Uh, coming to accounts payable process, in the accounts payable process, the focus or I'll rather go to the line item number seven, which is the receipt. So once the purchase order is given uh, during receipt of goods and services, the focus will be on whether, you know, uh, how the material or the services which we are receiving, how it is validated with the purchase order. If there is any discrepancy between the material and the services vis-a-vis -vis the order that we had given to the vendor. Uh, how does the shortfall or the discrepancies adjusted in terms of value or in terms of material rejection? What are the security controls at the place of receipt? What are the quality controls at the place of receipt? Uh, how is it demarcated that prior to quality clearance, the material which is received is kept in a separate area and who is the person who is creating the GRN in the system. In Once this entire process is covered, the next relevant process is the accounts payable process where the purchase order which is received and the GRN which is created and the invoice which is received from the managed from the vendor, all of these are matched from the purpose of ensuring that the payment is done correctly. So in the bill passing process, we do a two-way or a three-way match of the purchase order, the GRN and the invoice to validate that these documents are matching with each other and the provision and the payment is done only to the extent of material received. In terms of, in addition to the bill payable process, there is also a process of review of open purchase order so that any open purchase order given to the vendor if the vendor is not delivering against them, we are able to close it over a period of time to de-risk ourselves. Also, a process where all of these uh, invoices which are received are recorded centrally in a system so that it helps us in the account provisioning process. Coming to the payment process, uh, it is important to know the timeliness of the payment. Uh, the bank master details which will indicate the bank account number and the IFSC code and the bank and the nature of payment. Most of the organization today have migrated to host to host payment processing, which means that from the ERP, there is a bank payment file, which is auto migrated to the banking system for payment. But there are a lot of organization, which again, you know, have a lot of manual process in the, on the payment side. So the overall process of how the payment is done, how the approvals are done, how the uh, approvers are approving the checks or the bank payments, it is important to understand that. From an overall system perspective, uh, there are few system controls which are important. Uh, largely the system control will focus on whether there is a segregation of duty, who all have access to raise the purchase order uh, in the system, who all have got access to do the bill passing in the GRN, and whether all of these activities are segregated or not, whether there are edit reports which can be generated from the system, which can indicate the amendment done to the purchase order, amendment done to the, you know, any of the uh, masters. And all of these processes are also very important to get an overall assurance on the procurement process. Now we will dwell into each of these processes which we have discussed. So coming to uh, procurement planning, uh, the process are largely uh, divided into two. First is designing of the plan, which will also include whether we have a strategic sourcing, whether we have a approved procurement plan and an, you know further amendment to it. And second is monitoring our performance against the procurement plan. In terms of procurement planning, uh, the key risk is 
you know whether the purchasers are supported by requirement of the user department for which largely we will want to evaluate whether a procurement plan exists whether the company has defined an sop for the procurement plan and post this uh, the second step will be uh, in terms of whether there is any inaccuracy in the procurement plan for which there is a monthly monitoring of the variances done between the procurement plan the price at which we are procuring versus the budgeted pricing in terms of uh, monitoring of procurement plan again uh, who reviews the amendment of the procurement plan versus the actual and whether a proper root causing is done of the same and the root cause the actionable coming out of the root cause whether those actionables are being implemented with a defined time key issues which we have noted on the procurement plan is you know well, there may not be a appropriate procurement plan so an absence of a procurement plan or you know the entire planning guideline there is a lack of integration between production plan sales plan and procurement plan which ideally would mean that my sales plan would want a certain amount of production to be done but my production plan and procurement plan are not integrated which will lead to either excess procurement at some point of time or a shortage of procurement vis a vis the production plan uh, which will you know uh, result in a shortage of material whenever needed the third is in terms of standard inventory levels whether they are you know defined on a one time basis and then periodically review also the lead time which is defined or considered for this standard inventory level it has been noted that they are not reviewed on a periodic basis which results in again excess inventory or shortage of inventory uh, the fourth is periodic review of procurement plan to incorporate you know the changes uh, so for example my sales plan and production plan are generally dynamic and they will get reviewed or amended on an ongoing basis depending on the market scenario however my procurement plan may not get amended on a timely basis which will again result in either over procurement or under procurement the fifth one is procurement planning may arise or you know the, the need may come from different locations whether i have a process where i can consolidate these entire procurement at a plan level itself uh, so there are instances which we have noted in the past where the same is not carried out in terms of purchase requisition now this is the place where actually the user department uh, they come up with the requirement that they need you know this is sort of an advice or an instruction to the purchase department that we need to purchase x quantity of material because we need it for our future consumption the purchase requisition process ideally will cover uh, mrp which is a material requirement planning which primarily means that the extent uh, you know basis my production plan what is the quantity of each of the material i will need to purchase the second process is creating and generation of pr which means within the user department there is there will be authorized people who can create a purchase requisition the third step is approval of purchase requisition which is generally going to the head of department and the fourth is you know once this purchase requisition is created there may be subsequent requirement which may result in amendment and cancellation of this purchase requisition in terms of monitoring or open pr the objective is to ensure that in case you know there are open purchase requisition in the system uh, for a period exceeding a given threshold this threshold can be 60 days 90 days or 180 days depending on the nature of item being procured and the nature of you know industry in which you know uh, the company exists there is a process of reviewing of open purchase requisition and closing it in case the item is no longer required the objective is to ensure that <clears throat> the purchase department is not acting on this open pr 
and trying to purchase something which the company no longer require. Once this open PR as a part of this review, there is also a process where you know there is a root cause analysis being done for this long aged purchase acquisition and implementation of uh, corrective action basis the root cause analysis. Looking at the key risk and controls in the purchase requisition process, uh, the first risk we will cover is procurement of material, even though budget does not exist. So largely the controls against it is in most of the organization, a system based control where, you know, a, a purchase requisition can be raised only if the system has a budget amount against it. So the department head, or the user person, you know, function, they will review the purchase requisition requirement against the allocated budget prior to creation. Largely the system will not allow the purchase requisition to create if the budget does not have a value. As well as on a periodic basis, there will be someone who will be monitoring how much budget is left. And in case there is additional budget which is required, they will follow the process as per the company processes. The second risk is unauthorized purchases. So for example, uh, there are authorization limit in the system, which will allow people to approve the PR within the approved limits. In case there are any errors, in case there are any mistake in setting up this approved limit vis-a-vis -vis the manual authorized authority metrics, my ERP system may not be totally aligned to the authority metrics and people who are who do not have authority to create or approve may still be approving the PR above their allowed limits. Also, one of the key control is uh, the ERP system ideally will not allow any purchase order to be created in the system without a valid PR against it. The risk three uh, covers the processing error on account of incomplete PR. So it is important that all the mandatory fields in the PR are defined properly. So at the ERP configuration level, PR has all the important information. Ideally, this information should also cover the quantity of that particular material uh, within the inventory system so that the user department knows what is the existing inventory level prior to raising this purchase requisition. The purchase requisition needs to be reviewed and approved by the head of the function after verifying the material specification, the date of the requirement. Uh, without all of these mandatory information, the ERP system should not allow creation of the PR. Also, the purchase department will review the PR and in case uh, any of the information is either missing or inaccurate, they will want to send it back to the user department for verification. So one of the most common challenge which we have seen during our audit is the user department giving a very stringent timeline while creating a PR. So if the PR is created today, they will state that the expected delivery timeline is a week from now or two weeks from now. While they are aware that you know the, the standard delivery lead time for this particular item may be a couple of months as well. This results in a lot of while doing the review of the process, we need to be mindful of it. And in case the reason is, you know, on account of any understanding, which is attributable to the user department, then we need to speak to the user department and understand uh, the reason for putting such dates. In terms of uh, the risk number four, identifying inappropriate assignment of procurement access right. So it is also important that many places, the user department will also give their preferred vendor names and the information in the PR. So we need to validate, you know, what are the controls which are in place and what are the validation checks in the system to verify the key data fields of purchase requisition. Is it a drop down? Are there any uh, you know, checks and balances to ensure that the right values and the right uh, fields get picked up while creating the purchase requisition. 
next is in terms of all purchase requisition uh, not being processed timely and accurately for this i think the important thing is to ensure that there is always a vendors list a list of approved vendors which is maintained and uh, the same is followed also there is a process of reviewing and monitoring all open and approved purchase requisition trying to do on a periodic basis what is the process of reviewing of these open purchase order what is the root cause of these open purchase order and what is the actionable whether they needs to be closed or they need to be kept open because of any reason in terms of key issues which we have noted uh, the delay in requisitioning or order may result in stock out at the same time you know early procurement or excess procurement may also result in a working capital impact for us uh, unauthorized requisition so for example you know a user department ordering something which ideally should be ordered by a different team this may include the material also the quantity also and the vendor recommendation also uh, also many a cases the erp the thresholds which are limited, which are put in the erp for approval of pr may be different from the threshold which are written in the authority matrix the same is also identified as an issue uh, also you know in terms of excess procurement or shortage of procurement or you know not putting the exact details of the material which is required which will result in a lot of time investment by the procurement team in the wrong direction and which will result in overall delay of the purchase requisition the third process is vendor management so in vendor management there are multiple sub processes which focuses on identification of new suppliers on an ongoing basis the criteria on which new supplier or vendor can be selected the process of bidding and evaluation of supplier or vendor and the negotiation and selection of the supplier and contractor the second process is on the vendor master file which means uh, the process of managing the vendor master how the vendors are edited how the vendors are added or closed whether there is a independent team or there is a you know own team which carries out the which manages the vendor master records also on the supplier and category management doing a process of supplier relationship management to ensure that you know uh, we take regular feedback from the supplier and use them to make our processes better and supplier performance management which means that out of all the suppliers whom we are working with whether we have a process of rating them at the end of the year and ensuring that we are working only with good suppliers and not those suppliers with whom we have a dissatisfaction in working in terms of vendor management i think the uh, focus is of the risk number one is ensuring that there is a huge you know uh, adequate technical and commercial evaluation of the vendor so there has to be policies and procedures which needs to define what are the minimum threshold that our potential vendor should meet so that they are authorized to be empaneled with us so largely there are vendor setup forms you know vendor addition forms there are documents which are verified there are supporting documents which are obtained from the vendor there are credentials you know which or you know list of existing customers which the vendor provides many a times uh, <clears throat> our procurement team and user department will want to visit the vendor to see the size and scale of their work uh, many a times you know they will want the vendor to have certifications like iso right uh, many companies will have additional requirements where the vendor needs to be uh, you know meet certain additional criteria as well so that they can uh, work with the vendor also uh, company policies and procedures may define the minimum number of vendors to be empaneled for each category so uh, for example in the approved vendor list there are companies which says that they there needs to be at least five approved vendors 
at any point of time for each item so that the company has a choice you know available to which vendor the procurement should or the rfp or the purchase requisition should go to in terms of uh, also in there are cases where we need to go up to a single vendor only because the vendor may have a monopoly or there is an oem material the justification for sole sourcing needs to be documented and approved by the authorized personnel also the process of vendor development through which new vendor needs to be periodically identified either through putting advertisements in the newspaper or on company websites but most of the good companies also follow a process where there is a vendor development ongoing process throughout the year in terms of uh, repetition of vendor process vendor identification uh, the company generally has a list of empanel vendors for each item category uh, this list of empanel vendor is reviewed by the procurement team and the user department so that at any point of time there are adequate vendors which are available also these vendors are linked to specific items only so that from a company perspective the company knows that there are adequate vendors available for each of the items in terms of vendor uh, master there is a process and in many of the companies now there is an independent master mdm team master data management team which manages the entire entire governance over vendor master and item master and all other files so for all new vendors what are the supporting documentation who was the creator and what approval has been obtained by the user prior to addition of vendor a verification that you know these vendor already you know are new to the system and not already exist in the system also ensuring that you know the the person who is creating the vendor master is an independent person uh rather than the user the the department which is requesting for the same in terms of duplicate vendors ensuring that the at the erp system itself there are validation checks based on either a pan number or a gst number or a contact number which will throw up a notification that these vendor already exist in the system also on a quarterly basis there is a monitoring mechanism in many of the companies some company follows on a quarterly basis and some company follows on an annual basis where the entire vendor master file is reviewed and approved on a one time basis just to identify if there are any duplicate vendors the risk number 6 is on the vendor performance appraisal so this is to ensure that while there is a process of vendor development there is also an independent process of identifying which are the good vendors and which are the bad vendors uh, depending on the criteria of vendor performance management this is typically done once in a year the objective is to identify which are the vendors with whom we don't want to work and there are criteria which largely covers the quality of material the you know any rejection of material during the year the pricing which is being given by the vendor to the company on a on the request raised during the year uh, the feedback from the user department on the vendor basis which the entire vendor performance management is done for the vendors which are you know the company is unhappy this vendor may either be suspended or be terminated in case of terminated vendor there are controls in the erp system that these vendors uh, will not be eligible for raising any purchase order or making any payment in the future also final reconciliation of the vendors which are to be blocked or you know uh, versus actually blocked in the system so to ensure that all the vendors who have been approved for blocking all the vendors have been blocked in the system that is also something which is done in terms of key issues which we have identified the first observation or the key risk which we have identified is on the inappropriate vendor selection now when we speak about inappropriate vendor selection it means whether the vendor was meeting the criteria which was set by the company so many a companies 
will require that the vendor has to be at least more than five to 10 years in existence. The vendor should have a turnover of at least X number of crores. These are, you know, few of the criteria or the vendor should be, you know, uh, supplying to at least few of the good companies, reputed companies. The vendor should have a certification from different agencies. So if the vendor is not meeting this criteria, uh, there is a possibility that, you know, the vendor may, the material which is being supplied by the vendor may not be good. Also, in many a case, we also try to highlight whether the vendor is of the appropriate stature to be dealing with the company. So a company which has a very huge turnover and which, you know, are in the top notch of the companies in India, whether they will be wanting to dealing with vendors who don't have an independent workplace and may be operating from home or a very small factory or a very small gala. So this is something which we try to assess to identify whether there is any potential red flag from a procurement perspective. The second key issue is whether you know we have adequate vendors to reach out to for any procurement. If not, what is the reason? And are there any specific cases where, you know, most of the business is actually going on a single vendor? And in case, you know, there are any challenges with the business operations of this vendor, what is the mitigation plan? What is the risk that the company carries? So whether the company will be able to, if the business operations of the vendor stops, whether the company have any alternative vendors who can be developed or who can be approached in a short period of time so that there are no challenges with the operations of the company. The key issue number three is whether the company is able, you know, procuring material from unauthorized vendors. Uh, in the present scheme of things, uh, largely the management generally does not agree to going to vendors outside the approved vendor list unless there are any specific reason for which there will be exception approvals. The fourth is whether, you know, uh, the vendors who are suspended, who are blacklisted or the vendors who have not been assessed only, whether there are procurement which are continuing from such non-performing vendor. So that is the fourth risk which we identify where in the past, the material from vendor had been rejected. However, we are continuing to procure from this non-performing vendor, which again raises a red flag in the, you know, during our reviews to identify, you know, if there are any challenges with procurement. So purchase order process uh, largely will cover, you know, a creation of purchase order, PO amendment, PO cancellation, any emergency procurement. However, one of the important thing which, you know, we should ideally look at is the process of consolidating of requirement. So a request for a particular item may come from various locations and various departments. Generally, it is very important for the procurement team to collate all of these requirements and these requirements may be present or this may be an estimated requirement during the year also and try to see by increasing the requirement uh, what is how whether we are able to get a better rate or not or you know whether we are into a better negotiation power from the uh, vendors or not so the first process is in terms of purchase order whether they are approved by personal as per our authority metrics and we have seen many a cases where the authority matrix, which is there in the manual document, is generally not replicated correctly in the system, in the ERP system. We have also seen a lot of cases that, you know, uh, ERP systems like SAP have different series of purchase orders. And we have seen a lot of times there are configuration issues where a purchase order, where an authority matrix has been missed or incorrectly replicated for a particular series of purchase order. So while the purchase order series for OPEX and CAPEX 
may be following the authority matrix there is another series of purchase order which has no approval mapped against them which has resulted in issuance of po without any approval the risk number 2 is raising of po without appropriate price discovery so there are system controls which ensures that po ideally cannot be raised for a quantity higher than the pr however there will be system controls to ensure that the minimum lot size will be procured also in terms of you know in case the po is being manually approved whether the authorized signatory is reviewing the requirement of the you know mentioned in the pr while approving the purchase order the risk number 3 is in terms of purchase order and contract processing so <clears throat> if there are delay in receiving the material against the po there has to be a process of periodically monitoring the purchase order so that we know that the open purchase order are actually pertaining to the material which we are still wanting and in case we don't want the material there has to be a process of closing this open purchase order and communicating to the user department and to the vendor that these purchase orders are being closed and will not be required the process of contract to processing with the vendor is also extremely important it is important that while we are doing a comparison of quotation the comparison is done for vendors which are agreeing to all the general terms and condition and all the special commercial terms and condition and only those vendors who are agreeing to these identical terms and conditions are compared with each other if there is a vendor who has not agreed to a particular term and condition the same needs to be documented appropriately at the time of approval as well as in case there is a financial implication for it the same needs to be adjusted in the quotation comparison statement we also need to identify whether whether there are any cases of split purchase order whether there are you know multiple purchase order which are raised to same vendor during the same time period which can be done through data analytics which are available as on date coming to the po amendment process once the purchase order are raised there are situations which requires us to amend the purchase order so either reduce the quantity change the quantity change the price ideally the approval which are required for approving the purchase order amendment should either be same or ideally one approval level more than the people who had approved the original purchase order also this amended po if printed it should show that it has been amended through a watermark that is also one of the basic control which is there uh in most of the erps key issues which we have identified in the <clears throat> purchase order process splitting of purchase orders where the user department is raising multiple purchase order to circumvent a particular authority limit excessive dependency on a particular vendor which has resulted in inadequate price discovery which also results in excess cost of procurement uh, for the company while the purchase order has been raised by the vendor subsequently the vendor has not provided the material which has resulted in raising an emergency procurement even which has again resulted in higher cost of procurement for us again long pending open purchase order after a period of time since the vendor was not communicated that we don't need the material there are materials which are sent over a period of time also due to in unclear terms and conditions mentioned in the agreement and in the purchase orders and those contract obligations are not monitored by the vendor or the company there are legal you know challenges and disputes between both the parties
in terms of receipts of goods the key processes are gate passes quality check and segregating of material prior to quality check in privy of the time as well just a So in terms of uh, receipt of material, the key risk is whether we are ensuring that the material which we are receiving is of the same brand, same quality that we have ordered for and the same quantity. And how does our e ERP system restricts or validates that the material which is being inverted is the same as what was mentioned on the purchase order. The second risk is the gate pass not being prepared by the security personnel uh, for the truck. The security personnel not verifying that the material is present in the truck prior to the truck entering the premises. Also the ERP controls which should ensure that the gate pass is being created and the GRN is being created only as per the information which is available in the valid purchase order in the ERP system. The next risk is whether the receiving personnel is counting the material and also whether the gate security at the gate is also doing a physical verification of goods received for some of the sample trucks which are being uh, received. In terms of ERP control, it is also important that there is a tolerance level which is defined at the purchase order stage, which shall determine the extent to which excess material can be inverted. So it is also important to know the, you know, how we are doing a quantity check also of this material, whether we have adequate equipments in place to do a weighment of all type of material which has been received by the company and whether we have adequate equipments in place to do a quality check of all type of material which are being inverted by the company. It is very important to know whether you know there are gaps in this and in many cases you will always find that the weighment equipments are not present for for either very heavy for heavy very heavy material and also for materials which are of very lightweight and similarly for quality check once we speak to the quality department they will let us know that the, they are not carrying out quality check for various material which can also be validated through the quality check parameter in the inventory master in the ERP system. Few of the issues, material has been inverted. However, there is a delay in creating of the GRN. There is excess procurement or the excess material has been delivered vis-a-vis -vis the purchase order which has blocked our working capital. There is overstacking of material since material is not recorded through GRN. There is again a procurement which is done. There is usage of material without the quality check procedure and without the GRN. Uh, there is the material without quality check is not segregated uh, with the quality check material, which again results in usage of material without QC check. And in many cases, there are weak controls over the invoices, which is being given by the logistic service provider, resulting in excess cost. Coming to invoice processing, the controls largely focuses on three-way match of purchase order, GRN and invoices. The controls over purchase order and non-PO based invoices uh, and the overall payment processes, uh, how the process payment is being processed, if there is a manual process or a automated process. So the key issues that we have noted is generally ensuring that you know, uh, this, there is a segregation of duty 
between the person who is doing the bill passing and person who is approving the same. There is a three-way match which is being performed ideally with you know uh, configuration, appropriate configuration being done through the ERP system. The company should have a defined authority matrix or invoice entry and approval and the same should match with the ERP controls as well. The vendor should be paid at least as per the due date, which is mentioned in the purchase order. And also in terms of MSME, there is a compliance which is required to be done where these vendors are paid within 45 days of the supply of material. Also, if there is any advance payment, uh, these advance payment needs to be adjusted. Also, if there is any equator damages or penalty to be done, the same needs to be adjusted before the payment is done. There is also an important thing that the person who is approving the payment, what is the quality of information which is given to him? Does he have information on the vendor invoices? Does he have information on uh, you know whether the user department has approved the invoices? before it is handed over to uh, the accounts department for payment. In terms of accounts payable, uh, an aging report of the good spending invoice accounting report, which is there, and whether the provision is done for both you know, services received uh, and the GRN, uh, whether the auto provision is being done, this is something which is being reviewed. The key issues, uh, invoices being approved, though the material has not been received or the services have not been received, payment has been done against that. Duplicate invoices received by vendor, payment has been done against that. The payment has been done without adjustment of open advances or the liquidated damages or the penalty provisions. There is inadequate SODs and uh, the taxes, the GST, etc. is not accounted properly and provision has not been created for the goods received or the services received but not accounted in the same period. So largely uh, in the session we have covered the basic processes of procure to pay, what are the key risk and controls against it and what are the key issues which we generally know when we review the process of procure to pay. With this, I will end the slide deck. Uh, we will open the forum for any question and answer. And if there are no question and answer, we will move to the next topic. Thank you, Sachin, sir. Uh, there are few questions over the panel. So I am reading the questions and you may please answer the same. Yeah. Uh, in case of a blanket purchase orders, having staggered delivery, how can we ensure accurate automated delivery rating? Is vendor rating necessary for sole sources of vendors with respect to delivery? So, uh, extremely good question, first of all. Uh, in case of blanket purchase order, having staggered delivery, uh, I think uh, largely the focus has to be, uh, I'm quite sure it is very difficult to find a system-based data to identify a delivery rating, right? But it is important that, you know, uh, whenever we have requested the vendor to provide us the material or services on time, there has to be a monitoring of the same about the timeline which is committed by the vendor, whether it has been met or not. So uh, against a blanket purchase order, if there are requests which are made to the vendor, there has to be a monitoring to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, the vendor has been delivering as per the timeline. This is something which needs to be done. Depending on the ERP and the maturity of the organization may not be necessarily a system-based delivery rating, but 
maybe it will require a lot of uh, manual data intervention as well. Again, sole source vendor uh, with respect to delivery. If you ask me, my perspective is we need to do a vendor rating. Pose that whether we have the flexibility of stopping the vendor, that is a very different conversation, right? But it is important for us to know that, you know, whether the vendor uh, is meeting our requirement on a timely basis or not, that will help us in identifying the pain point. If the pain point becomes more severe, I'm quite sure, you know, the organization would try to find more alternate vendors, if not necessary from the same geography, they may try to identify from other geography as well. Okay, thank you, sir. The next question is to bypass employee as a vendor, the vendors can create a company in the name of a spouse or parents. Is there any way to control this? Uh, I'll tell you, there is no way to control this, but there is a monitoring control which we have identified for which we are trying to work on, which can highlight few of these cases, not necessarily all the cases. So uh, through the you know information which is available across uh, government websites, we should try to identify if we have the contact number of the spouse or the parents, and these may be available in the HR database through emergency contact number or through dependent information in the insurance policy. Through the phone number, we should try to identify if there are PAN numbers which are linked to these phone numbers. And through the PAN numbers, we can identify if there are GST numbers which are registered against the PAN number. Suppose that it is good. Obviously, you know, the parents and the spouse can have their independent business. But if their independent business, the nature of business, you know, through this methodology, if you are able to identify a few of the cases, uh, the nature of business is very much aligned to the nature of business of the company, then this will be red flags for further investigation. Okay, thank you. The next question is, should an approved PO, which is subsequently deleted, also have additional approvals? Generally, we have, in most of the cases, not seen an additional approval for deletion, not deletion, I think the appropriate word will be cancellation of purchase order. An approved PO ideally can never be deleted. It can only be canceled. So cancellation ideally does not require any additional approvals unless we are speaking about a stage where the vendor has kept the material ready for us and then we are canceling it, right? Which, which the system cannot identify, but otherwise a cancellation we have not seen having additional approvals. I think what we need is a consensus of the user department and the procurement team. And with this consensus, the purchase order can be canceled. Thank you. The next question is, what if the process of PO payment happens verbally and no documents to check the same, then what can be the risk involved? What if the process of PO payments happen verbally? Happens verbally and no documents to check the same, then what can be the risk involved? I think... Uh... <clears throat> I'm not able to understand the entire question because of the English. So uh, your process of purchase order can happen verbally. Payment obviously will happen through system, right? So process of PO happening verbally would ideally mean that someone is calling the vendor and asking him to send the material and deciding the rates, etc. over the phone, right? In which case I would say that, you know, from an overall process governance perspective, it is going to be a very high risk process because there is no vendor development. There is no vendor, uh, adequate vendor available to us. There is a huge chance that the pricing or the you know procurement is at a high price compared to market. It also happens in a lot of you can say you know promoter driven organization which are more person dependent, where there is a lot of trust in the person who is making this procurement, but from an audit and review perspective, I'm quite sure if something is carried out wrongly by this person, there will be a lot of 
repercussion on the control side and on the value side for this organization. Okay, thank you. Sir, we'll take the last question because of the time permission. Mm -hmm. For example, in the organization, I am preparing authority metrics where PO is approved by director and invoice can later be approved by HOD. Is this okay? Or we need to have an authorization of a director on the invoice also. Any suggestion how to address this scenario? Uh, Mule bhai, uh, so largely, if you ask me, if, when I look at procurement, my full focus is to ensure that, you know, a lot of diligence is done till the stage of approval of purchase order, right? Post that the process is largely only ensuring that we receive what we had requested and we pay according to what we have received. So in your organization, if there is an authority matrix where the purchase order is approved by the director and the director I'm assuming has to be senior from the HOD, it means that the director is mandating what to procure, how much to procure, from whom to procure, and by what timeline it needs to be procured. Post that once the material is received, and there are adequate ERP controls to ensure system-based ERP check, the invoice approval is only a formality because it is, you know, uh, the invoice will only, uh, you can say, you know, it's a validation that the appropriate material or service has been received at the value which is approved by the director earlier. So it only becomes a formality if you ask me I don't see a, any risk in this. It means all the uh, intelligent work is done by the director and only the approval part of the invoice, which will indicate that the material of the service has been received is being done by the HOD of the user department. Whereby is taking responsibility that the invoice can be processed because material has been or service has been received. So from my perspective, from a control perspective, and looking at the diversity of organization in India, but not necessary, you know, everything has to be ERP based and every organization will follow a largely ERP based process. I don't see any additional risk due to it. Thank you, sir. And uh, the balance question we will answer on the respective individual check. So I will request, uh, I myself will be giving a vote of thanks to the today's speaker. Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the WIRC ICAI, myself, CA Nero Sayya, would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our today's learned speaker, CA Sachin Malu, sir, for enriching our knowledge, making all of us learn the audit process, procure to pay in a very simple and easy manner, and sharing his valuable insights and experience to our learnings. I thank you all the participants present and making the time in attending the session. I will request all of you to have a virtual applause for thanking the today's speaker, T.A. Sachin sir, and thank you one and all. Uh, from my purpose, uh, I would like to thank to WIRC to give me this opportunity. It was wonderful to share knowledge with all of you. Same on this side, sir. Uh, thank you, Sachin, sir. I would like to introduce the next speaker for our session, C.A. Chetan Bhattar, sir. He qualified a chartered accountant in the year 2000. He completed strategic leadership program from IIM Ahmedabad. He has done EMBA from Harvard Management Mentor, USA. He is certified risk management from ICAI. He has stopped in 2011. He is a certified internal auditor from USA. He has completed diploma in information system audit. On the forefront of his professional background, his career has spent over the last 28 years and he has done various audit of a large listed MNCs, Banks, to name a few, Aditya Birla Group, ONGC, LNT, ACC, Crompton Greaves, Blue Star, Air India, New India Assurance, SBI Bank, ICSI, Exim, Bank of Baroda, Bank of India. 
and have also served in a public listed companies and CA firms in various capacity as a director, assistant vice president, GM, and ATC. Presently is working with the JSW Steel Jindal Group as an associate vice president, group head, audit and risk management for steel, port, cement, energy, and mining verticals. His last stint was with Prism Cement Limited as a head management assurance and with Ambuja Cement Limited as a head corporate audit. He is a subject matter expert in the areas of internal audit, internal controls over financial reporting, operational audit, management audit, system audit, process improvement study, fraud investigation, financial due diligence, risk management, ethics and compliance, and ERP implementation. I welcome CA Chetan Thakkar, sir for addressing the today's session. And it will be really, sir, everyone's our honor in having a good and great session from you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, the house at Neeraj for introducing. And uh, well, my sister, thanks to Murtuza Bhai who invited me for the session to share my views on the subject. And to start with, I think Sachin has made my job a little tougher after having such an important business process, P2P, and that too in a greater detail, uh, let's say I'll try to, justi uh, try to justify the next uh, important business process control I to retire. Uh, I hope I'm audible and just allow me a second time, I will upload my presentation. Yes, sir. Your voice is very much audible. Okay, fine. Is the presentation visible to you all, please? Yes, sir. Presentation visible, Nero? Yes, it is visible, sir. Yeah, sure, sure. So we'll talk about the, uh, like any other, like O2C, P2P, S2R is also one of the most important uh, business process area. And uh, to my experience, all this year, this is again a, a quite difficult area to audit. It's not that easy as like uh, doing a transaction audit because a lot of uh, human capital related aspects are being covered by auditors. And I will take a pause. I will not necessarily take through all the processes of HR prior to retire. I think those are very well available and the basics will be known to most of us. I will take a pause to important uh, pointers in the, each of the sub process. And we discuss this in a greater details with the practical examples rather than I take through the theory. So friends, the entire presentation on hire to retire, I divided into seven parts. We'll talk about the recruitment, we talk about payroll process. We'll talk about performance management. We talk about separation termination process. We talk about the important compliance, employee relation, the important personal records that has to be seen by auditor. And the, finally, the most important one is the success in planning. So let's start with the first process. The most important internal compliance may be a O2C, P2P, or S2R, or you do fixes it audit, inventory audit, any business process audit. The important thing to start as a good internal auditor, we should look through the policy. May it be inventory policy, maybe HR policy, procurement policy. So that is, you know, internal compliance. Ultimately, the policy is nothing but it is a tone at the top. What are the expectations by the top management? May it be CEO, may it be CFO, may it be CMO, or maybe managing director of the company. And we have to look at the uh, these policies and the procedure, which is the detailed guideline which employee has to follow against which the policies has been set by the top management. So first thing you need to see whether HR policy and procedure are doing, is being documented, is there any SOPs and are they up to date? It should not happen. The policies speak something else and the actual process is something else. And essentially, you need to see that importantly, these HR policy and procedure SOP has to be reviewed periodically. It should happen somewhere, maybe five, 10 years before I prepared some manual as a documentary, maybe for IFC purpose or just, uh, just to convince statute auditor. And then practically, you know, I have never been reviewed after a lot of things have been changed. So we need to see whether those SOPs and policies are up to date. So this is one of the key area where we have to look into. And the most important after that, is it being aware? Is the employee across the board, may it be branches, marketing, your plants, your corporates, all of these, are they aware about this policy and do they have access to that? Sometimes, you know, policies, they prepare policies by a very good consultant or a very experienced people. 
but unfortunately those policies are not being available to the employee or may not be aware about that so we need to check that awareness check on that the third important and sub process in recruitment manpower planning whether do whether the whether we have a done a, a manpower planning department wise across the location all the business units do we have the approved plan have we do we have a hr budget approved we need to check that importantly is it hr budget being approved department wise is the actual position are being planned and the most important from audit perspective see uh, by experience it has been seen you need to analyze okay, what are the unfilled position with the aging analysis so miss it says during the year there are 1000 position needs to be filled up and says still there are around 250 300 positions are not been yet filled with maybe the age of is 6 to 8 months so we, that becomes you know there is somewhere something wrong in the system so that become alarming so we need to brought to that notice through our audit observation some of the as a good governance process and as a good benchmark practice uh, some large and good companies do a third party assessment they do a manpower planning is that manpower planning done by the company is adequate is the right set of people are being recruited so you should ask for any third party assessment done by the management so that is again a one of the reference point for an audit for an internal auditors the next one is the vacancy creation do they have a manpower requisition form formal is it a right authority as per delegation of matrix or authority has authorized for such vacancy do do that particular position vacancy has the proper kras kpis or job description and what are the competency required what qualification and experience required for that position has to be very clearly documented we need to check on that and the, this is the next area is most important area how are you going to source your candidate see first of all we have to see uh, we source from a, a thing which doesn't add a cost the, we need to analyze say if I, if I, if i have filled up say 100 vacancies during the last one year how many of that 100 are from internal job posting because see, that doesn't involve a cost and you give opportunity to your own people other people in the department or across the company because this doesn't involve a cost and the right talent will get the opportunity so you need to see out of that say 500 how many are from internal job costing which is very important referral through referral policy many good companies have a tendency to have a referral policy if you refer for particular department or particular position there will be some token referral of 20000 25000 50000 so company will save heavily on this consultants advertisement and job website cost sometime it may happen even through personal reference contract somebody may be personally knowing the position what looking that that can also can be evaluated again a uh, cost friendly next is the job website job website is again a lost uh, like nokri.com monster other job website which is although may have a very less cost than compared to the consultant what we pay 10% 15% and sometime it may go up to 18% so we need to see how the sourcing of candidate has been done as an internal auditor and see the cost friendly see barring few critical position where when necessarily you have to go and explore through consultant we should try and analyze the total sourcing done for the period of review how the sourcing has been done and we can talk about the efficacy of the sourcing methodology followed by the hr team the next one is about procedure for candidate selection so that is again a very routine approve whether it is approved proper interview panel has been there selection has been done is the proper assessment has been followed and now next one is most important the one of the most important area if i have to say in recruitment is about background check see that is even my last week board meeting the observation on hr background check has been gone it has went all up to discussion from ca for to md to board what will happen somebody has forged the document of his date of leaving or somebody has forged it is salary slip or somebody is being absconded so this is all what i found out not by talking to the various agency that we get the report from a background external agencies they given that are at very minimal cost so one should without fail if you are doing hr audit and you are reviewing recruitment it is the one of the most important documentation one need to see reference check and background check what what one can see in background check is there any criminal is there any criminal records against the candidate is the certificate profession certificates are being forged is the residence address is incorrectly mentioned is the kyc document is being forged 
is the document of experience certificate is forged. A relieving letter is being forged. Notice period not so, absconding one. And reference check, what has been given by the uh, candidate? Is it really making sense or any negative remarks about that candidate? And still we are hiring it. Somebody said he may not have been performed up to mark or he just absconded in between. He is very irregular or not up to the mark or uh, knowledge to the subject he is being hired. So, so uh, this is very, very important document. You need to check. My experience says most of the company don't spend on background check. Let me tell you the cost is very minimal. It is it is as low as 3,000 to 5,000 rupees per candidate, but it's worth spending. And if your uh, HR don't do background check, at least we as intern auditor should be very clearly asked for this. This is then one of the important gap in the system about background check if it is not done for a set of particular role or particular position. We suggest that even at JSW, background check has to, at JSW, we do background check across all levels, irrespective of role and position designation, because that has given a lot of insights to our HR as well. And most important, just need to see that uh, is that replacement clause, if somebody, uh, you know, somebody leave within a six month, is there any replacement clause with this agencies? So that needs to be seen importantly. So again, a good gesture, very few companies have seen my career. We give letter to the rejected applicants as a good gesture. So whether this, even this, some you don't have to every time negative and exceptional reporting. Sometimes you have to write even some good practice being followed by HR. So as if somebody is being rejected with some clear reason, we need to give. So you know that sets a good example and set a good example for the candidates. At least even if he is not being selected, at least you give as a gesture rejected latest. And then you need to check, is there any rejoining happened during the period of preview? Is it rehiring? And we need to particularly change, check whether company policy. Yeah, JSW, to be honestly, my current company, we don't do rehiring. Once you leave JSW, it is, you cannot join without the approval of chairman and MD. Only MD or chairman can allow your reappointment or rehiring. So once you leave JSW, there is no scope or chance to come back to JSW. So that is what very clearly mentioned in our company HR policy. So if it is, do that company has that rejoining policy, how many rehiring cases we've seen? And although it become more critical, more important, if you rehire from some of your competitors, then I don't have to say more on that. If, if we are rehiring, somebody left us and rehiring and joined the competitor and again, he want to join back. I think we have to pose a question and uh, we have to pose a question to the HR uh, being on the process of rehiring from competitor company. Then important when most of the time, you know, we hire people and some higher and critical roles, say somebody at the production, somebody at marketing or maybe risk management, we give them a joining bonus. Maybe because he has not served the notice pay, we reimburse on that, or he has rules on some performance pay, or we want to hire some best companies, a good, uh, very diligent uh, candidate. We may would like to give a joining bonus. If that is nothing wrong in giving joining bonus. Again, you have to check the policy the company mandate on that. And what is more important, if you're giving somebody a joining bonus, I'm sure it should be a very clear cut mention in your appointment letter or a hiring letter. You will clearly say you have been given XYZ amount as a joining bonus and you will be written with the company for next two years. If you resign within two years, company has a right to recover the joining bonus as a good governance practice. As people will just join, get the joining bonus MAG one of the six to eight months time and then company will lose at the end of the day. So we need to have a check and balance on that. Okay, that is all about recruitment. So important point that I'll just summarize. The turn at the top policy procedure, you need to see important sourcing of candidate, internal job costing through consultant, advertisement, job site, a second best uh, checkpoints as a gray area. Then important background check, reference check, I said it is one of the most important in, uh, in the sub-process of recruitment and then rehiring cases, joining bonus cases. So this you have to critically examine these cases. I'm sure you will be able to get into the uh, right set of questions on this. The second one is payroll. Payroll is ultimately the you know major chunk for any company, anything in the range of 12 to 15 percent of total cost, POJ is the payroll cost. At least 10 to 12% of total cost belongs to payroll. So you understand, depend on your uh, 
size of the business, how important and the big ticket item is payroll. The most important sub process is to check on the employee master data management. See, because master data management normally check at the when somebody joined, once they will get the approved later, all the data about his PA, basic, HRA, variable pay, bonus, all his component conveyance, everything has been mentioned in master data management. And once that is being inserted and duly approved through maker checker, then at least for next 12 months, practically nobody look at the uh, master data. Only then the next cycle of increment happen, then again you go and change your master data. If there are no proper maker checker assess, there are proper check change logs, audit trail. If somebody's basic salary is one lakh and somebody say make it 150 or say make it two lakh, you can understand the repo question. Because as a HR also, I will have the opportunity to see, say I got more than around 70,000 employees. JSW, I have more than 70,000 employees, it's still itself. So I don't have a bandwidth to check it every month or every quarter to see whether the 70,000, many people will come in, many people will go in, there will be attrition, there will be joining, there would be transfer. So the most important, we need to check the audit logs, change controls. We need to check any duplication in data management. There would be a scope, a greater scope here to identify even the ghost employees. Easy ghost employees are being set in the master data management and then there is physically not available. These are called ghost employees. We, uh, past experience, we saw a lot of a few employees who are employees of the company are even acting as a vendor by just doing a simple VLOOKUP on their Aadhaar card or their PEN card. You get to learn employees are working in the capacity of vendor and I'm sure most of the company's code of conduct doesn't allow employees to act as of vendors. So this is one of the, again, the most important gray area, a good auditable area for we as a internal auditors. The second one, review compensation structure, whether it is compatible, equitable. So we need to check the range, you know, there should not be say somebody is a manager, CA chartered accountant we hire for account finance or say audit. And somebody with the 10 years, if, if somebody existing is already in the system with the 10 year experience, I am paying 30 lakhs. And if hiring somebody, say with 12 to 15 lakhs rupees, so it should not happen. There has to be a minimum gap between the uh, same position, same experience. As what will happen, you your hiring, you don't you take a lot of uh, cost is involved even hiring. So it should not happen after you get into system, two, three months, you get to learn other person are running 30, 35 lakhs with the same experience, position and the qualification and I have been given only 12 lakh. So, no, and then he will move out. So we have to make sure that compensation structures, there has to be a complete transparency, equitable and it is competitive. So that also falls under our review. So we have to see these are attracting and it should it should help the management to retain the talent because hiring has also a lot of cost involved. We discussed about payroll register review is most important. Uh, friends, let me tell you many companies, many companies, payroll register, uh, payroll assess data is not given internal auditor for review. So you should not write in your, so my clear suggestion, we should not write that I have been given access to the payroll register. That should not come as a part of the scope. Rather, it should come as a disclaimer. Disclaimer to your audit report. And it should be mentioned very boldly saying that payroll has not been reviewed by us in the absence of data assets given to us. So you should be bold enough to mention in your audit report about as an audit limitation for payroll. I have been doing all these years, wherever, which of the company, if I have not been given access on payroll, because of sensitivity, management has some reservation. So we are fine. We are okay not to review. But the most important, you should make limitation in your audit report and very clearly say payroll data has not been shared with us in your report. Very categorically in a board in, after your scope of income and after your scope of audit as a audit limitation and disclaimer. The next important item where you see a lot of observation on attendance, leave application, a different set of uh, attendance, early go, late coming, no punching, manual punching, biometrics, facial expression. There are different set of attendance rules by way uh, company does plant level, maybe register or a biometric company level, maybe using facial. So different set of uh, methodology company use it, the leave application, different set of all purpose leave, PA, LSL. So well, how the records are being maintained, maker checker. Importantly for the senior management also, 
how the attendance and leave has been taken care most of the companies uh, they are outside and they have given a lot of leave on this attendance leave so what your company follows which you reviewing it for the senior management check for the abnormal pattern analysis in the leave and the most important one is basically whether your leave say we use a mantra or we use some other other software and my payroll is happening in the sap or oracle whether they have a interface so it is okay to have a, a dedicated software to attend leave and attendance but then what is important it should not be um, it should not be manually match it, it has to be a interface between this erp system and with this attendance and leave application uh, monitoring system so most of the places we have seen uh, uh, barring a few large companies this interface is not available so there is always a chance a room where the misappropriation and the misleading people can play with the leave even somebody is not came somebody may uh, show as a, a paid leave or somebody who has not attended not done log out log in or not attended not done od may play with the things and they can claim the salary fully so i think this is again a very gray area a pain area from an audit perspective uh sometime some of the and most of the mncs and the companies what i have audited i've seen uh, the payroll processing is given because of the confidentiality not only given review for audit even it is entire payroll processing is being outsourced to the third party so it is very important to go to the third party spend a couple of days understand the scope of the work the kind of software they do it the how the data inputs is coming what kind of processing they do it how the output goes without any manual intervention uh, what are the challenges they face i have seen lot of surprises my career while doing third party vendor visit for uh, vendors who do payroll processing so this is very interesting area and very important area isop isop is again a very important you know nowadays isop is so we need to check the approvals coverage calculation disbursement and the next as a basic control but the most important control doing a reconciliation to the financial record you need to check the variances between two periods the same salary in the last month same salary in the same period and you have to do variance analysis because that gives ke last month say net my uh, salary payout is say 200 crore and uh, say in the month of april 2024 i got it 200 crore as my net payout on salary for my corporate office and this this may I, if i do a salary processing my net pay is going to 325 crore then it has to alarm me is there real increase of 125 or there is somebody has paid with this we need to then check it okay, how many people joined left whether that at least at 125 crore additional incremental salary payout is accurate or no so the reconciliation may be a very simple process it sounds but it is very important to do the reconciliation without fail friends again one of the very important gray area wherever i do hr audit and if i am at the say plant i i go and see if the some contractor has uh, done through that manual register or through a card punching said ki today 120 people have entered into the plant and when i am on the plant i make sure that i take the round of the plant and i make sure that 120 people are really there or is there any 110 people or are there 100 people and then i would love to check further so whatever they claim 120 people enter the plant so not only from a, a payroll perspective from safety perspective also is very very important what is being claimed and you know somebody is in the system is there actually as per record and physically and it is the same state of whether it is quali- uh, skill semi skill unskilled with the right set of people being mentioned in the register with the names and the position are really being there issue it may happen he may claim ki 50 people skill people has being entered in your premises and actually a skill may be only 35 the other other 15 may be semi skill or unskill so you know because their rate their rates are different because skill is been paid as a higher side and semi skill and unskill is paid always a lower side than the skill labels so this is again a very gray area we find out during our audit people are claiming more people getting in actual physically they are not available that become very sensitive you have to sensitize that and more important they are claiming a wrong set of people they claim that 50 people enter as a skill but actually it is 35 so friends summarize on the second uh, sub process the most important areas to see here are master data management your payroll register review the reconciliation important 
segregation of duty is again a most important maker checker and the last one what we discussed about uh, surprise count to check on the ghost employees equally in the system so this is all about the uh, second process so let's get into the third process now the third one is about performance evaluation so that happens once in a year the most, the most important you need to check the policy every year performance evaluation although it is a uh, uh, generic guidelines have been given in the our HR policy, but every year we get the policy ki, say what percentage of the people should uh, increment percentage. Is it if you are good, very good, or you are outstanding? Say this year it would be 8%, 10%, 12%. So that policy differ year on year. It is duly approved by the topmost people, MD or group CFO. We need to check the documentation approvals for the same. Whether approval system is whether the approval system is fair, is it really transparent or is it linked to organization goal? See, because at the uh, said my company and I have seen other other when in my consulting role, your performance is not only based on your personal individual goals. It is important also to be the goals of the corporate. Say in our company example, the junior level manager and below, the individual goal setting may give seventy five percent weightage. Organization goals like EBITDA, market share, sales, relation may have 25%. So for them, uh, the uh, achievement through the organization is a 25% because their personal achievement is given higher weightage. And now come to this is somebody at senior like us. It is reverse. 60% is based on the your personal goal and 40% goes to organization goal. So weightage goes up as you as your uh, responsibility towards the organization goal is more to achieve more profitability. The second most important feedback given is there any clear cut objective criteria while you do a performance evaluation? So you need to check and if there are gaps, what it has to be a development plans for those employees has to be very clearly mentioned what exactly development is required during this performance evaluation. Increment and promotion. See, one basic thing is very clear, HR. Uh, see, performance evaluation is for your past performance. Whatever the performance you have done, say, I have done whatever best performance I had at 23, 24. I have been given increments say, in the month of April or October. And, and the promotions are basically your future course of your, your future aspirations. What you can do it. So these are two different things. Increments and performance is the past, based for past performance. And promotions are given for your potential and future prospects. So you need to check variable pay. Some people call incentive. Some people can uh, say bonuses. So that is also very important. Management come out with the policy. This is variable pay. So here every come in my company at least everybody has got more senior you are. So total CDC 30% goes to variable pay. Then it is linked to your rating. Are you very good, outstanding? You may get more or less, or you get protected based on your individual rating and company rating. So you need to check on the calculation, validity, authorization, approval. It has went into the system properly, do proper sampling, do overall assessment. And one more important area is uh, we need to check the policy. This is again a gray area from the performance management perspective. You need to check the uh, appraisals or incentive. What is the company policy? If somebody leave in between the company, is he eligible to variable pay? Do he had need to be given a appropriate bonuses or variable pay? Say some, some company, even you work say 365 days, and if you leave say 30th March, and on the day when you are supposed to be given incentive variable pay, you are not then in the system, or if you are not serve as of 31st, 31st March, you will not get, even you have a performance variable pay of say 25 lakh rupees, as per part of CTC, you will not get a, a single rupee. So you need to check or maybe based on the rating, your variable pay will differ. Say in my CTC example, say that 25 lakh has been allocated on a variable pay and 75 lakhs example is a fixed pay. So that's come to CTC as a once year. But if say my this time rating is say uh, fair, even below the good, and my variable pay is 25 lakh, I'm supposed to get say 10 lakh or 12 lakh, 50% of even my protected value. So, so what I'm trained to give by these practical examples, you need to check the policy the policy matter, a proper approval, and the right set of incentive has been given to the people who are left, transfer, and more importantly, the employee who are suspended or terminated employees. 
even they have completed the term, even they have say I am in the say May month, I am so I have there so up to May. But if I say somewhere on the 15th, then the 15th of May, the employee has been terminated or suspended. Is he eligible to such kind of incentive or bonuses? So you need to be very clear. Even those, even you get those instances is good. And if you're not receiving during your review, you don't get such instances. But say this may occur at any point of time. So as a being intern auditor, it is not necessary you to give that uh, corrective action. You can give a future course of preventive action as well and recommend that or what kind of policy management want to act upon such cases of termination or transfer cases. So before I get into the next process, we discuss important uh, how transparent, fair, how your uh, performance is linked to organization goal and individual goal. The most important is a variable pay payout, importantly for people who left in between or suspended or terminated employees. So that guidance has to be necessarily given by the top management. So next important area is the separation. When employee leaves, what are the areas and the checks and balances you need to take care? So the most important one is whether timely removal from the payroll has been done. It happens or timely removal of say IT system, your SAP system, say you have your HR system, your email system, the moment your last day comes, all ha assets has to be removed. And my experience shows at many places, at many audit companies, what I have done it. Unfortunately, this has been delayed. Somebody is being authorized security to bank. Even we reported in past, it may, even the matter has been gone to IFC as a, in, is a inadequate uh, business process where you know people who leave, their names are not being struck out in the bank as authorized signatory. Somebody who is already being uh, join and replace him has not communicated to the bank, you know, as an authorized signatory. There was a sizable delay. Somebody is still assessed to the SAP to sensitive data of the company. Somebody is still into getting the emails. So most important, uh, you can be in a touch with the IT team and get that data from a backend, whether disabling the assess rights, withdrawal from their payroll. It should not happen. Somebody has whether in payroll system in SAP also HR module that employee has been taken out for that cutoff date of his last day. It should not happen. He should continue to pay uh, payroll to him. So this is the one of the most important gray area, important pain area for HR where we have, we can contribute and we check in a timely basis, whether all the removal of the uh, assess is disabled. Yes or no. The important, the compliance is with the legal requirement. We need to check the important one is, I think most of the, even we as the inter auditor, we don't get into the exit interview forms, feedback mechanism. This is a very important. You can make a, a very classical uh, reasoning analysis. You can review the important people who left during the, and whether they are candid enough, bold enough to write in the interviews. Or normally I have seen most of the, even management also don't, even HODs, HR, they're not really very keen. They just simply write, we are living for a better prospects. 10 out of 8 cases written, written, it is uh, better, better prospects. But that is not really, you know, the case. We all know that uh, a company is sometimes very good, financially strong, growing. A uh, lot of prospects, but unfortunately, because of the bad bosses, employee leaves. So we need to get into if the reasonable analysis of employee leave is, or there is no proper MIS by even to HR, to the top management. So this is, I think, again, very important uh, process from a uh, separation uh, process. We need to check a proper analysis of exit interview is being taken care of or it is not taken as a only a checklist set of thing. A proper feedback mechanism has to be ensured. Uh, this is how, you know, you will able to retain a good talent. And, you know, all we all know employees, again, are being most important HR capital asset for any company. What is important, you make a analysis of full and final are pending six months, eight months. Ideally, it should happen less than a month's time. Some good companies give check on the last day. I've seen a, a good MNCs or large corporates who gives the final full and final check on the last day of the employment. And there are companies I've seen, they are pending cases for six months, eight months, one year. I think we are not then setting a good turn, tone for an employee, at least who leaves. Because see, there's somebody who worked for a company for a long, and if he's living, and if you don't settle the due for six months, eight months, see, they are the immediate one. They are our brand ambassadors, practically. 
and if you don't pay attention i think uh, the uh, bad word will spread faster than a good word so this is again a uh, very important uh, not from just settling down the dues of the employees it is important from reputation risk as well otherwise it will damage the reputation of they being our uh, brand ambassador all this time may create a bad name for a company and that's how company name get deferred and affect the reputation of that company please next important attrition analysis just check what attrition analysis period on period same year in the last time check the industry practice same sector say i am in the power i will check what is the attrition rate with the jw energy what is the adani energy adani power attrition rate what is the reliance energy what is the tata power uh, attrition rates so i need benchmark with my peers with my own data with my period uh, last year with my period last month is it alarming because see it is a cost recruiting somebody somebody you get it he take 2 3 months to get settled then he start performing after 6 8 months lot of course go cost goes into his uh, appointment training consultants and again he say leave it so that is a big cost recruitment is again a big cost okay we discuss at the start of the session so attrition rate analysis please do that whether we do a benchmarking if they are not doing it hr please make that suggestion so ultimately what is expected out of we as a good auditor is what kind of benchmarking good practices we suggest to intern audit we suggest to the top management and the top team so that is how you get the chair right chair in the you know management meeting otherwise you will keep keeping they will keep you set aside and they will look at you as a checklist auditors the again most important separation process at least for the key position somebody at finance or ceo level or somebody at production marketing chief or some production head product plant head if he is living and joining the competitors do we have a non compete agreements so this is a very important uh, set of document especially for cso cxo position somebody at a junior accountant or an admin guy or an junior hr guy is joining competitor that doesn't make a great difference unless it is damaging but it is very important somebody senior people living at our your organization and joining other and you know he will share the trade secrets the geographical uh, important the uh, product know how the list of the key vendors list of the key customers and they take away the customers vendors so this become very very most important audit area if this is not being done as a practice we must suggest that and you should come and sit in your audit report very clearly ki whether wherever the senior people whether we have a non compete agreement a set of policy and procedure is there or not there and what could be the implication so friends here the important thing removal of all important assets withdrawing all assets from it payroll sap bank everything is there was one of the gray area we discuss non compete agreement is again most important thing exit interview we discuss and important if you are delaying your full and final beyond a normal uh, course of the time then you are uh, spreading a bad ambassador who had worked with us and this will be a bigger repercussion of reputation risk so these are the few more uh, high and critical important audit areas pain areas where we as intern auditor should look into while doing separation process compliance is see compliance is also very important so labor compliance like pf compliance whether ot compliance whether you are making say you are doing a factory audit how that compliance so important example whether your ot ot overtime you are giving whether it is not more than 50 hours per quarter are we putting so much pressure on our uh, laborers and making them work more than 50 hours which is against the which is against the factory act like, are we making your employees continuously working for more than 10 days this is against not allowed under factory act like. okay so these are very important are we following the apprenticeships are you making your employee continuously working are you getting apprenticeship 2.5% of your total strength including your own on roll plus contract labors many companies i have seen they are not complying with this they are not taking apprenticeship and this is the annual compliance every year every incremental growth in the manpower own and contractual we essentially has to work on that so you all know that even the important compliance have now come dpdp act data privacy act it act see we discussed about the biometric special recognition uh, in fact we implemented across the board 
because see getting these biometrics or facial uh, facial facial uh, for attendance records of your own employee or contracted people that require an assent that require a written written consent very clearly and that has to be consent has to be given by respective employees irrespective of contractual or own so most of the companies even we audited doesn't follow that so we suggested on the war footing basis the dpdp uh, we have to take the written consent form across across the board all employees all location all verticals and this is so this is how you play a important role as inter auditor so these are the you know new set of uh, rules which come in you have to guide them whether the safety protocol is being there whether the data privacy policies are being communicated are the employees supposed to know what they have to disclose inside or outside the company is there is there any uh, proper system of handling complaints and grievances do the investigation is happening impartially and thoroughly is there any whistle blower policy is being communicated is that being posted uh, policies through a company website is there awareness session has been happening these are all like the most important we discuss whether there is a posh policy is the code of conduct is being oh, people are aware about code of conduct is there is, do they aware what kind of conduct they should not do say example not accepting gift not giving bribes zero tolerance code of ethics what kind of ethics is expected from each employee say zero tolerance say in the i was talking in the last week we were discussing with the md when observation on background check the 4g is uh, relieving later so md says nothing doing then uh, finance said that he is doing very good he is doing out outstanding performance even after joining he may have done under pressure he is 4g is relieving later because of the delay in joining but an md is very clear we have to set the tone zero tolerance whatever good you may be performing outstanding but if there is a integrity issue it is zero tolerance and that these do those employees have been asked to terminated immediately so that is a set of tone you need to check a kind of tone on the posh code of conduct code of ethics so friends i i shared with you important uh, important to know about the compliance is on pa 40 apprenticeship factories act so and so forth bonus act apprenticeship act dpdp act we need to so these are important things important about knowing the different posh coc coe policies uh, a right to say and share whether we are wbs policy we need to check on that so these are important pointers pain areas where we can get into greater details the next one is important the this is again important personal records whether we have a uh, mandatory documents minimum documents whether we have obtained all the kyc document pan aadhar whether we have set side up whether we do the proper check on there through background a communication address is correct meko most of the time you know all certificates living letter experience letter so you should have a very clear cut checklist on your person records now it is a digitalized nowadays most of the places but still some places physical thing it is a physical or digitalization whatever mode it is we need to check the minimum minimum docs are being taken care whether this records are stored securely is there any access is restricted whether we regularly reviewed for the completeness whether how long we need to retain this records is more important say under companies act we have to retain this for 8 8 years or under it act we have to retain 10 years or maybe company policy we have to retain for a larger period so you need to check if that they have no policy on that you then that itself become your uh design 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 control failure so there is no design company is not very sure how long they want to retain and what set of document they want to retain under various acts or under various companies act and it act is very clearly defined but we should also define as a company how long you want to retain this uh, important documents of your employee and again important thing the disposal of this when to dispose after how long and then lastly whether any initiative taken on digitalization so friends here the upon important area minimum documentation the disposal the retention and the most important digitalization initiative taken if any and the last but the not least one of the most important which most of 10 out of 10 out of one or two or three company i have seen i audited in my career people don't have a succession planning a very clear cut 
succession planning document i hardly seen in any any companies barring very good companies i have seen that because there is no plan somebody leave all of sudden ceo resign md being asked to go cfo asked to go finance controller on a plant head and then you know thing get disturbed so we should always create second and third line with the timeline of 2 to 5 5 to 10 years horizon so you need to check the uh, whether we want succession planning at what all roles with the finance roles risk risk uh, risk management role or somebody who is handling merger acquisition somebody is uh, on a critical position for the new projects somebody at the uh, very large plant so you need to you need to be very clearly how prepared your organization a kind of role and position which requires succession planning then just see whether that planning process is importantly done for all leadership and critical roles assess the uh, a kind of initiative uh, say my company we have future fit leaders program for a top team for senior management like us a middle management and a junior management like somebody goes to i am amdavad somebody go to bangalore so i am bangalore somebody has been given brown university the top management somebody has been given opportunity to harvard based on this is all in the uh, endeavor to see we are ready with the next line of future leaders even say in my company to be very honestly even my uh, promotions for the somebody above say 52 or 55 we have to be clearly delegate your, and create your second line okay if you don't do that you fail to do that as a leader say you are a 50 or 52 years and if you are not created a second line then your promotion get prolonged every year and year so it is a responsibility of all the leaders to make sure that he will create leader after him so if he all the sudden he has to go at least the second line is ready to take over immediately and important in upskilling the existing tower so friends as we discuss succession planning one of the very important very few company do that and uh, it makes a reputation risk even somebody leave it and you won't find immediately a second succession plan just evaluate overall process identification the documentation the future fit leadership preparedness has to be seen so these are uh, some of the key areas which one can see so this is all from my side i have tried to give as much practical examples as i can uh, it is it is not that easy like you do inventory audit fix a set audit your account receivable table because it has to be more deal with the human capital so you need to be very tactical because human is being involved human capital is involved for this audit so you need to be very very cautious on this so that's all from my side uh, may i request any question i am happy to take please thank you chetan sir so on behalf of our audience i'll take up the questions quickly sure uh, we have question relating to uh, in an organization where master data payroll processing leave updation is concentrated in the hands of two persons what are the additional risk ia should focus see uh, it is always advisable because master data as i told you is a very crucial because that is also reviewed only after year on year once once you join the company and then year after when increment happens it is okay to have two three person we should not have a multiple even there are multiple we have reported in past many places i have reported if there are in spite of two there are say eight or 10 people then you said there are nothing to do with so many people should not be given an assess okay so it is always a good idea to have minimum people and but what is important there has to be maker checker periodically on this data so maker checker and audit log which is very as you all know that audit trail which has came in january under this caro reporting and company that is so important and this is again important so we don't have to do a audit trail either on your erp like sap oracle even the new requirement come in february 2024 and there is a FAQ. You need to have audit trail in databases which is set on, which is set separately. So not only on the ARP, also on database. So I don't unless there is a maker checker and minimum people should have given and there has to be proper SOD. So that's a good idea to do that, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll take up the next one. Uh, is the bell curve still an acceptable industry practice for performance evaluation? Uh, it's a good question. Bell curve is there across. JSW is also not exception. Very good. Few MNCs have uh, done away with this, but I think this is the tool. You know, uh, because you cannot give everybody outstanding in VG. Everybody cannot perform at the same space. 
somebody is, uh, say I have a target of say 10 crore and if I had done 25 crore saving this year, so certainly I will go and sit into very good or outstanding. And if I give 10 crore target and I end up with only 50 lakhs, and if I give you very good, somebody will run 25 crore. Example, I'm just giving example, practical example. And other guy who has, other leader who had done just 50 lakh or once here, I cannot give both very good. Unless there is some compelling reasons. And again, frankly, being in practical and candid, bell curve is a tool actually in the hands of the top management and HR tool. They ideally, uh, HR, uh, play with this. And uh, I explained the uh, rational being having this bell curve. Still, it is not a uh, rollout it is still there in most 10 out of 8 companies. I am still seeing bell curve is very well prevailed. Although it's not an, a really good practice, but as a measure of evolution, uh, it is an industry practice, please. Correct, correct. True. Uh, there was one question on uh, uh, good agencies, name of good agencies who does background check in Ahmedabad. So it's very specific. Uh, it is uh, most of big fours are doing. There are many. See, it is. I don't have to say. Even you, a lot of HR consultants. There are specialized agencies. I think uh, Google or you can check with your local uh, HR consultant like ABC, Havoc, and the, all big fours do these services. Their cost may be little more, but they do also good job. And I'm telling you, I have hired a KPMG for three thousand five hundred, five thousand per per. It again your scope. What you want in the background check. You wanted to check on the criminal records, have they for the certificate or you want just KYC document validation or you want to check the residence, you want to check the last office, you check with their bosses, whether you want 360 degree, you want whether 360 degree uh, background check or reference check or you want just this immediate bosses for in the last two references. So it uh, all depends a kind of scope your cost involved and important the position. If I am hiring uh, for CFO, CEO or I am a finance controller or a plant head, Definitely, I would like to do on the scope more checks because he is going to handle the most sensitive and critical position in my company. So I don't mind spending five again 15,000 for that background. And I am okay somebody account or admin office or a clerical position and spending just 2,000 and get his background. So these are you know different aspects needs to be practically seen. Consultants are available. It need not to be Namdawad. It can be anywhere. If somebody sitting in Mumbai can do a candidate. Uh, sitting in Delhi, Bangalore, Chennai, anywhere. So I hope I answered this question with you insights on that. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I'll take up the next one. See. The com companies having a practice of hiring retiring employees as consultants in the same role or responsibility. This leads to high attrition in the second line. Is there a way to control or mitigate it? Consultant in the same role. Same companies line. have a practice of hiring. High attrition aspect. The retiring and I think that's a not a good industry practice. But what happened? It happens in my company is also not an exception because they feel somebody is having twenty twenty five remain in the company and then taken consultant. Only it uh, deprive the young generation and the you know young buddies and who have that aspiration, energy level and uh, experience. Uh, yeah, so that give a uh, dissatisfaction. And it amounts to a high attrition. I completely agree to that. It happens, but that is again the how critical that a senior person who is retiring and taken as a consultant. So uh, yes, uh, that is a pact industry practice, unfortunately. And because of that, we lose uh, most of the time good young and uh, candid candidates from company. I think as so, internal auditor. I believe we can only highlight this part, right? That... We can always highlight, but uh, we have done in the past, but that is again, because these are the people, it doesn't happen. They don't uh, retain everyone. Mm -hmm. As again, sir, 100 people retire at the senior level, say GA, VP or HODs, not at 100 people, maybe taken 6 to 8 people out of that. Others are being given retirement on the last day. Because these are the people, they have earned the value, confidence in the top management, and they have demonstrated and they inclined to work. I don't see the way forward whether we have energy when we become 60s, we have energy to work after 60 is a question mark. Still, we are seeing such cases, a few cases here and there. But way forward, I don't know, nobody would like to work after 60. People would rather like to have regretted retired at 55 or 50 to have a work-life balance. If you keep working 30, 35 years, what will remain for you to enjoy your personal life after 60? You will not have energy. You have money, you will have time, but you don't have energy in that point of time. So, uh, this scenario will automatically go away, ma'am. In the time to come, my personal views. 
the next is uh, most of data under hr and payroll review is unstructured how do we automate our internal audit procedures and implement those Um, sorry, I missed out. I was looking at the other question. Uh, can you come back? Uh, yeah, what, yeah, I sure. what I suggest, huh? Because I am saying there are many questions. See, I can yeah. answer them uh, at the later stage. You may save it, or they can. You may uh, share my slide uh, with the presentation with everyone. I am fine with that. It yeah, has yeah. my email ID and my uh, mobile number, so they can come and talk to me. So that's fine with me. Only you take a few questions because I am saying the more than dozens of more than dozen questions are here. So you take only important ones, and uh, you may share my presentation. They may in touch with me through email, or I'm happy to answer and being in touch with the my candidate. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Your presentation will be available uh, uh, on the WRC website, and I believe mm -hmm. the session also will be uploaded on the WRC YouTube channel. All the sure. attendees, participants sure. can see. So you that. can take a couple of one or two questions. Uh, sure, sure. That's fine, but don't take all because uh, the purity of time. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, I would take the last one. Then, how can we address the issue of employee integrity in the case of field location sales employee, for example, employee taking cash or gifts from employees? Can fraud prevention policy address this risk or any other measure to address this risk? See, uh, integrity is something cannot be taught. I always talk to my team, my audit team, wherever I have been. It is to imbibe. This cannot be taught. You don't do this, or you don't ask for bribe, or you don't forge it. This cannot be taught. Only repercussion. Wherever I worked, the large company also in JSW. Before that, I was in Hosim Raja Group. There is a zero tolerance. Management can only come out with the policy on code of conduct and code of ethics. This is zero tolerance in this. You may be a best performer. You may be doing what best. But if you if you fail on integrity, I given practical example last week when we reported the background check, there was a delay in uh, giving the uh, where there is a delay in giving. Uh, Offer later, the gentleman forges the living letter from last company. When it comes to our background check, and MD says clearly, he has to be terminated immediately, because today he has done that. Tomorrow he can do a bigger uh, damage, and it will affect the reputation risk to the company. So we have zero tolerance on integrity. So integrity cannot be taught in any school of thoughts. This has to be imbibed, and it has to be seen in your conduct, and it should be in spirit, not in forms. It cannot be taught anywhere, ma'am. You have to imbibe, when these are your. This is how one person differ from other person, and these are your values. True. That true. has to be preserved and demonstrated, please. This cannot be taught any school. My personal views. Only okay. company can come out with the policies. They try educate, and important one, company should do uh, awareness. It should not happen. I accept the gift of twenty five thousand, and my company says you cannot accept the gifts. Or if my company says it is okay to take a gift of ten thousand, and if I accept the gift of fifty thousand. If I go to income tax and I pay say fifty thousand, company says there is we don't have to give bribe. We are okay to get into litigation, and I am not aware about and I have given this. So awareness, what company can do, and integrity, you have to demonstrate. So that's all. Uh, I hope I answer the query of the. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, I'll just take the last one because I find this interesting. <laughs> yeah, what please. Control. What control needs to be defined in systems to avoid backdated changes with respect to joining date or transfer date? See, basically, uh, what I say once you it is be as I the first control somebody asks that first of all there should be a minimum. There should be a minimum people who have access to master. So that is a preventing control. You are not keeping room open for many people. So the malpractice can happen, or somebody may play with that. Detective control is that. You can review that audit logs. Okay, review of audit logs. At least you will be able to catch all and prevent you. You keep a minimum people into that. And third one is a periodical review. So putting this corrective, compensatory and preventive control, you can check on that. Although you know masters can be changed after every year. Okay, but you can always do a periodical review through third party or through our own team. I hope I able to answer the three set or three to four. It again depend. You can what kind of control you want to with the respective environment your company is into. Yes, definitely. It answers. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So thank you for uh, all your patience hearing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. So in, in today's session on hire to retire session, our speaker C H Chetan Thakkar, sir. Has not only taken us through each process under hire to retire, but also highlighted key areas to focus yeah. at risk and controls under each process, various compliances, 
which an internal auditor should focus upon and should be concerned upon. I hope all of us have many key, ta key takeaways from this session. So on behalf of WRC and all the members present in the session, Thank would present a vote of thanks to you, sir, and would Thank also appreciate so the much. audience for the participation in the session. This Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, come, Parsif, all our passion to hear me out. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Particularly, we keep in touch, all of you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you.